We're ready to rock and roll. Let's do it. Thank you, Mark. All right, everybody, welcome. Welcome to Lit Bomb. We are here to provide you with a little relief in these times of stress and sturm und drang for you. Um, a little literary relief, a little uplift, a little, a little panacea for what ails you. Um, we have a great show for you tonight. We have Patricia Spears Jones, we have Dean Costas, and we have Richard Jeffrey Newman, who will be reading at the feature section of this program. And now I would like to introduce my co-host. Um, it's my privilege to introduce the lovely and talented Mark Vincennes. Um, Mark Vincennes has published 14 books of poetry, including more recently Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, and Here Comes the Night Dust. Vincennes is a prolific translator and has published 10 books of translations, most recently unexpected development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Merz, uh, and which was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in translation. His work has received fellowships and grants from the Swiss Arts Council, the Literary Colloquium Berlin, the National Endowment for the Arts and the Witter Binner Foundation for Poetry. He has the unique distinction of having been nominated for a Pushcart Prize 37 times. And, oh my God. He, and, he deserved oh my God. It, and he deserved it each and every time. Mark, would you grace us with a poem? This one's called um, Uncle Fernando's Daring Advice on How to Enrich the Soil. Take a strand of language and forge it in moonlight. Weave it with artistry and know in the doing what really occurred is more than this. Bury a word or two, a cherry red noun, then a dead verb. For everything you return shall become part of you. Know then you are conducting a holistic pagan rite steeped in ancient mythology. Watch the emanation of the noumena or the jinn creep under your tongue and sense what really occurred is far reaching, deep into the magnetic heart. For when shoots emerge coat, coated in rich sunlight, your words will become the skin of the earth. Mm, wonderful. Yay. So. Thank you. And now you read my propaganda. I'm going to do your propaganda, Larissa. Don't you worry about it. <laughs> Larissa's newest novel is Sly Bang. Uh, and let me tell you, it's Sly and it's about a bang as well. Um, her first novel is Patient Women. Her poetry collections are Medusa's Country, which came out from Mad Hat Press, uh, Special Characters from Unlikely Books, in Paran from Blazebox, the chapbook A Cure for Suicide from Chavena Barber Press, and the ebook Fib Sequence from Architist Ebooks. Her poetry albums are The No Net World and Exorcism, for which she won the new Century Best Spoken Word Album Award. Um, Larissa's work has appeared in the anthologies Measure for Measure, <clears throat> Words for the Wedding from Penguin, uh, Contemporary Russian Poetry from Dolky Archives, and Choice Words, Writers on Abortion from Haymarket. Uh, Larissa is the original English language translator of the futurist opera, Victory Over the Sun by Alexei uh, Krushnyev. Krushnyev? Kurikoni. Kurikoni? <laughs> <coughs> Performed at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Garage Museum of Moscow, the Brooklyn Academy of Music and Theaters and Universities Worldwide. Uh, Larissa has also edited the anthology 21st Century Russian Poetry from Big Bridge Press. She has been a translator for the Eugene A. Nieder Institute for Biblical Scholarship of the American Bible Society. Please see more about Larissa at her website, www.larissashmilo.com. Well, right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. I thought since Bloomsday is coming up on Tuesday, I would bring some Joyce to the reading today. One summer, um, 
I took it in my head to erase the 18 episodes of Ulysses into 18 poems. And so I am going to share with you an erasure poem, uh, a found poem in effect, um, from the Lotus Eaters section of Ulysses. By lorries along Sir John Rogerson's quay, past Nichols the Undertaker's, 11 dare say, sent his right hand with slow grace over his hair. Where was the chap I saw in that picture somewhere? Ah, in the Dead Sea, floating on his back. It's a law like that, curriculum crack. It's the force of gravity of earth is the weight per second per second, post office, too late. Eleven, is it? I only heard it last night. What's wrong with him? Dead, and he filled up all right. Chloroform, laudanum, sleeping draughts, phlegm. Better leave him the paper and get shut of him. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce my other co-host, the lovely and talented Jonathan Penton. In 1998, Jonathan Penton founded unlikelystories.org. Since then, he has lent editorial and management assistance to a number of literary and artistic ventures, such as Mad Hat and Big Bridge. He has organized literary performances and performed himself in Arkansas, California, Chihuahua, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Louisiana, Massachusetts, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Oregon, Texas, and Washington State and DC. His poetry books are Last Chap, Blood and Salsa and Painting Rust, Prosthetic Gods, and Standards of Sedity, and the free eChap backstories. You can download that from Argotist eBooks to read. And I'm very pleased to welcome Jonathan. Jonathan, are you reading a poem of your own or are you reading a poem of one of your contributors to Unlikely? I'm going to read a poem uh, from one of the, my contributors. Um, I'm not terribly prolific. I write enough to get in on our feet, on our uh, founders readings, but um, I don't I don't have a new poem every week. Um, so instead, I'm going to read um, a poem that we published this week at www.unlikelystories.org, which, as Larissa says, has been publishing since 1998. This is by Vincent A. Salucci, and Vincent will be reading here at Lip Balm on June the 27th. This is called Distance Intimacy by Vincent A. Salucci. Light candles for video conference. If none, the aurora borealis. Where's the Ouroboros? Zoom background will do. Put on your finest silk underclothes, given that you aren't going to change from them. Open the china cabinets and silver. Set the dining room table desk with all the linens. You can finally get around to iron. Plate your takeout, soup, or frozen veggies lunch, taking those oft-neglected extra steps to wipe rims and read a grace poem. Use crystal stemware for all your virtual networking toasts. Pick and post for other lonely loves, likes, and comments. Avoid another didactic rant to the social mob. Act vulnerable, you know, like there's a global pandemic. When your virtual boss asks you to do something inane, admit the best we can do is really, isn't really necessary, doctors, nurses, healthcare officials, and emergency responders excluded. Bring your children in as meeting opening acts, new magic tricks, dances, a worldwide variety show. Going grocery shopping together online becomes a family outing, a borel on bowl, corrugated cardboard souvenirs for everyone. Instead, message your oldest friends, Search the farthest corners of your contact clouds. Worst comes to worst, just call your best friend you haven't talked to in months. The plague is a good time to talk about the past. Recount the sacraments of reconciliation and confirmation for your soulmate to further edify your personal escape from organized religion. Read books round robin and rocking chairs. Compare conventions like characterizations, themes, symbols to the current crisis, mostly what is education anyway. Take sunshine hikes or strolls in the park, depending on the size of your city. You can still greet people as you dodge them. Compliment the scarf wrapped over their face. Not the mask, but the eyes behind the mask. 
Again, that's uh, Distance Intimacy by Vincent A. Salucci. Okay, it's time for our features. I'm very pleased to introduce Dean Costas. Uh, Dean Costas' memoir, The Boy Who Listened to Paintings, was recently released. It was his ninth book. It is a finalist for the Forward Indies Award. His 10th book, Broken Color, is forthcoming from Mad Hat Press. Costas' most recent poetry collection is Pierced by Night Colored Threads. His previous books include This Is Not a Skyscraper, the recipient of the Benjamin Solomon Poetry Award, selected by Matt Doty, Rivering, Last Supper of the Senses, The Sentence That Ended with a Comma, and the chapbook Celestial Rust. He co-edited Mama's Boy, a Lambda Book Award finalist, and edited Pomegranate Seeds. His debut reading was held at the United Nations. He was the recipient of a Rockefeller Foundation Cultural Innovation Grant. Dean? Thank you very much. I'm gonna begin with, a, I hope, a timely poem. Starts with an epigraph from um, the New York Times. An unarmed West African immigrant with no criminal record was killed on February 4th, 1999 by four New York City police officers who fired 41 shots at him in the doorway of his Bronx apartment building. Amadou Diallo's ghost reminisces. Ice cream tasted like America. I bought a pint that night. Caramel flecked with almonds. Celebration sold more than my quota of gloves, scarves, and keychains. Saving for college, savoring spoonfuls, I ambled back to Wheeler Avenue, back to the vestibule, a bulb, the only light, bald eye. Voices pounced from darkness. Police, hold it, stay there. But they wore jackets and jeans. I fumbled with keys, couldn't. Turn around, keep your hands or we can see them, they snarled. Shouts from every angle, a hive of voices. I couldn't think, couldn't act fast enough. Dropped my keys, the ice cream. Here, my hands. I thrust them up to the crescent moon. My palms, pages waiting to be inscribed. Yeah, that's him. Kids, show us ID. As I jammed hand into pocket to grab my wallet, I looked down, saw ice cream oozing from crushed cardboard. Gun. He's got a gun, a cop growled. Their voices became one voice, their mouths the muzzles of guns. Metallic words bit into me, one after one, gashes, one after one, leaden flies swarming, tearing my flesh. What had I done? I tried to ask but fell. Couldn't fall far enough. Couldn't be slaughtered fast enough. Sharp metal pumping into me. Blood sluicing pavement cracks. The slivered moon reflected in crimson. Bullets drilled until I closed my lids. Saw myself float toward the vestibule. Saw myself slip through its closed door, my 41 eyes gleaming. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, the next poem is unfortunately relevant also. Um, it's called 19, the word 19 is spelled out. Um, the next, and the, it, the, um, it's a sonnet. The five words of each line begin with the letters C O V I D. 19. Clusters of velveteen infernal daffodils continue opening. Vernal, injured, defiled. Can't overlook viciousness. I descant, crowing ominously. Vile, I dare, crises occur, violent illness, death, contain oneself, 
victorious? Idiocy darkens courage. Observe verdant inscriptions decay. Crazed, obscure vermin. Illness, dust, crawls over vistas in despair. Can oblivion's voice invoke dogwoods? Convert obscene verses? Impede, destroy, counter, counter obsession, vexing instead, diabolical. Crackle of veins, impale design, come, offer verity, implore deity. And I'll end, because I think we were, I think we were asked to end, to read three poems, am I correct? Can you hear me? We, we can hear you fine. I think everyone was waiting for me to answer and I was waiting for everyone else. Um, three poems is fine, you know, four poems, yeah. Okay, um, then if I'll, I'll read four short poems. Um, okay. okay. Give me a second here. Um, okay. Nostalgia for now. Sometimes I see people and feel as if I've missed them, even though I may never have met them before. Say, the way a woman wears a plum-colored scarf over an old leather jacket inspires, it's so good to see her again. But I have never seen her before. Or when I spot a young unshaven man for the first time trundling an encased cello down the street on its wobbling wheel. It's as though I were peering through memory with great nostalgia. This moment in September, this wind, this peculiar green tinge of light. And I'll end with, bear with me a moment. Um, page 13. I like form, so this is a villanelle. Um, I, my COVID poem is a made up form of form that I, I invented myself. At least that, to the best of my knowledge, I, I invented that COVID form. Uh, perhaps someone else knows differently. This, this is a villanelle. It's called Ice Garden. While, while the grandfather sleeps, dreaming of snow, he sees ice statues, selves he can't forget. They've come to teach what he couldn't know. Each younger self extends a hand, a tableau of withered opportunities, regrets. While the grandfather sleeps, dreaming of snow, their phantoms parade past his mind's window. They glissade as if spelling with a planchette, having come to teach what none can know in youth's thorny tangle of demands. Now he crosses a threshold, a birth, a death. While the grandfather sleeps dreaming of snow, his boy and young man's selves attempt to let the ancient man they've become undergo a transformation, forgiving what he couldn't know before. His embrace melts them as he speaks to the wraiths, they vanish like vapor through a net while the grandfather sleeps, dreaming of snow. He expands into being what he couldn't know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, we're, our, our pleasure. We're really glad you're here. Um, okay, round of applause for Dean, let him see. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.
And next we're gonna hear from Patricia Spears Jones. Patricia is a poet, playwright, anthologist, educator, and cultural activist. She won the 2017 Jackson Poetry Prize from Poets and Writers. She is the author of A Lucent Fire, New and Selected Poems, and 10 other poetry collections. Her work is anthologized in A Poetry and Protest from Emmett Till to Travion Martin, BAX, Best, Exper Best American Experimental Writing, 2016, uh, the 2017 Pushcart Prize, uh, The Best of Small Presses, and Angels of Ascent, a Norton Anthology of Contemporary African American Poetry. Poems have recently appeared in The New Yorker, Dark Matter, Women Witnessing, Ms., Muse, Plume, Persimmon Tree, and Cutthroat, to Journal of the Arts. She edited Think, Poems for Aretha Franklin Inauguration Day Hat, and Ordinary Women, an anthology of New York City women poets. She is a literary programs curator and a former program coordinator for the Poetry Project at St. Mark's Church, organizer of the American Poets Congress, and a senior fellow emeritus of the Black, Art, the Black Earth Institute. She was the Louis D. Rubin Writer in Residence at Hollins University, Spring 2020. Patricia, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, are you going to switch me now to speak reviews? Or uh, okay, now I can see. I can see you. Yeah. Okay, all right. So everybody can see me and hear me. Yes, yes of course. That's good. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Dean. Thank uh, you. I haven't heard you know Dean read in a while, so that was fun. The last time was in the park. <laughs> I'm going to switch up the mood because I don't think everything is so horrible, horrible, horrible. I think things are very amazing and changing, and I am happy to see that. Sorry that it would take terrible things to make things change, but, you know, that is life. So uh, I'm going to start with a poem that uh, just reminds us of what the values are in this country. And it's based on, um, you know, several years ago, uh, James Brown finally left his mortal coil and, uh, and he was put on display at the Apollo where uh, it was, everybody was told not to take pictures. Of course, the New York Post took a picture and that was on the front page news. And here is my response a.k.a. my James Brown poem. Mary J. Bly sings, No One Will Do. James Brown's waxed face graces the New York Post. Carnival starts in Harlem two months early. All of Soul Nation step to the curb and kicks it. Say it loud. Oh, verily, his brilliantine hair tight pants, and tiny dancing feet laid out beautifully. The sullen city, unsignified, tears and dancing, like church, girl, like church. Yes, this ambassador of soul has returned his credentials. No regrets, godfather a misnomer. He was here to represent soul nation, and like Cuba, Soul Nation remains unrecognized. But folk visit Soul Nation daily, crossing the border to that shining party on the hill, where folks are eating chick fried chicken, drinking seven and seven, and smoking cool cigarettes, while disco balls swerve and curve the smoky air like plump women having a really, really good time. This behavior continues to shock citizens of soul less nation, busy as they are with their markets, markers, and ministers without portfolio. They see only the smiling countenances of miserable men and women, oh so folkloric, in fake fur floor length coats, rhinestone, and hot pants. Soul Nation gives up polyrhythms and an occasional orgasmic freak. Gotta get off of that thing and make yourself feel better. Get up off of that thing and change <laughs> the shape of weather. Because sometimes what you're on ain't no good, no way. You really, really gotta get off of that thing. Demand 
the woman, this soulless nation with the odd white man in charge on a ranch, a barge, fishing, whatever, violent death follow. Best to join the ambassador of soul who brought us the ache and art of Black America claiming patriarchy of funk and feeling just about as good as you can get. When you walk a walk so defiant, everyone wants to sample your will. And this year, Mary J sings about who will do and who won't. We of the folkloric know that only the hardest working man will do. And even in repose, he's working the room, lit like a saint and made up better than any well-off hooker, hands and feet hidden beneath rough tough to sadden, so we can, can't see his wings. All right, so let's give it up for Soul Nation here, because Soul Nation is out in force right now. Um, I was asked to be part of an uh, anthology uh, in the first um, year of the Obama administration, and there were poems for the first 100 days and I think my day was number 55 or 56. Anyway, strange things happened that day. It starts with a epigram, quote, Niagara Park's police chief, Doug Kane said, the man unilaterally uh, entered into the water and refused medical assistance at the bottom. I'm having a hard time because I'm looking at Dean looking at me. So I'm trying to figure out how to, change this view uh, yeah i don't think speaker view ever shows yourself a bit, it was like a little strange I'm like, Hi, Dean, but, you know. <laughs> what the fates allow one sometimes a plunge is a plunge depending on time of day sleeplessness repeated seeking bottom the world is fabric unraveling thread by thread and clotho and her sisters appear to be on strike. Enough, you despoilers of our hearts, consumers of our children, disbelievers and betrayers of health. We won't help you anymore. So there's Stacey chatting about how the rainbows used to be prettier and why the old gods are so useless nowadays. And while one man refuses rescue in the North, Another murders Kith and Ken in the South. Aisha's bliss. Waterfalls are fiercer than we can. We imagine family, time, family bonds weaker than convention's desire. These voluntary moments of desperation that mayhem on a sunny day in the sunny South mirror our media's advertisements for quote domestic unquote abuse the boyfriend vaguely contrite the girlfriend nowhere in sight should she return should he go to jail duet recorded and soon to be revealed meanwhile teenage girls are beaten daily leading to a brisk business at cosmetic counter two our continent's resources were so abundant, many nations thrived even as newly arrived Europeans sacked temples and released horses, pigs, changing travel, topography, the hunting rights so carefully negotiated. Fevers, deaths, the quest for more land, more gold, an old story made young again in the glass wall structures of ravenous plutocrats. How this experiment in democracy became formidable was almost lost in the dust and quiver of Tower's death. A crisis fraught for the corrupted pleasure of a Shakespeare reality show. Hal to Henry, but no Falstaff, leading us with this moment of scarcity, anxiety, and change, making some of us giddy and hopeful. No president no matter his heart strength and his mind's obsidian edge can do what we all must do seek lachesis wisdom beg 
the sinner's forgiveness, offer up our desire for a world made whole with threads from a stronger, more flexible fabric illuminated our future shared differently. An American Haze. And this has a line from Brenda Hillman. A thunderclouds cracks and volunteers. Trumpeter lilies argue the loudest sense. You could wrap a fiesta with that smell. And when done, you will know you're at a funeral parlor and tears are falling, falling. Stars brighten, dancing figures, the ones that Jasper Johns remixes. Oh, elderly DJ, got that pepper in his pocket. Who knows these people in the desert? Volunteers come with food and water left for desperados, the men, women, children stumbling into an American haze. They too, these volunteers, are illegal, told to leave the desert unfootprinted, even as the men, women, children mark the earth, calling on insects, birds, and beasts to follow, to gather, to take what is left of the stumbled bodies. The border between good and evil can be porous, or hard as steel, or an ideology of hatred. The country is full of ideologues and the border cracks. And then a couple of more poems and a final one for this time. Okay, so I never met him, but I, I, I write poems that are sometimes totally like fiction, and this is totally fiction. This is um, about Elio Ortiz, Chica, uh, who was um, a Brazilian artist and uh, who died, you know, many years ago. But he hung out in the East Village in the late 60s, early 70s. He was very gay, but I don't care. I still like him. And so this is called Old oh, That Brazilian Guy. Did I ever see Elio walking some part East Village, curly headed and densely? packed with art and drugs and death's constant shadow? Was he on, on the corner of Avenue B and 10th Street drinking beer and ogling the pretty Puerto Rican girls? Was he ogling me? Or was he living in an abandoned warehouse, holding on to his pencil, pen, brush on paper, cardboard, found trash or garment district fabric, offloaded by a gang out of the project's Whisking, whisking splatter of heroin lost income. Backstory, he, he did a lot of dealing. Anyway, go back. Okay. Drop dangling from a cup of bitches brew. Oh, how to speculate this mad Hendrix loving artist moving in El Barrio, Loisaida, or was he uptown, Spanish Harlem, or on the west side, Greenwich Village? Hanging with the drag queens, early a.m., everybody tired from the bars, the piers, the crumbling edifices, circa late 60s, early 70s, Nueva York, Nueva York. He was on a wild ride, the weed, his dash, the dazzled dreams of men who had survived torture, military repression, a bad economy, yet learned to take acid trips one day at a time. Oh, the love affairs we have with the myth of the what ifs and that drug paraphernalia. Oh, night seeker, ill name, moon winds your direction home. Thus created this mixed up third world, loud music, your lips dry from screaming in January when something mighty Hendrix sun lack on a fat meant for napping midday exhausted. Thus, the making of a hammock, a thing of beauty, backlit by the gallerist while duct tape coiled the rafters of some street legal post, fly fishing flies, pretended bait, tight pants dropped here and there as thriving masquerade of the handsome Brazilian who could have been the best bad news boyfriend ever. 
And there's finally this for the person who must be gone in November. This was written when um, Gabi was finally kicked out. And before he was kicked out, he had to do one last performance. And we're gonna see a lot of performances over the next few weeks. People, be prepared for fucking anything. Defiant. Fruit from one tangle, from, excuse me, fruit from one vine tangles with another, making a mess of the intended harvest. Yet, the lack of calculation is welcome. The accident that shifts bodies from shadows into a locus of light, midday bright and caustic, wounds unhealed. Cameras trap this old and angry man in a beast folk suit, lifting white papers and refusing to read them, mumbles unwelcome threats and thanks the nation. The nation kicks him out. Finally defiant after years of misrule, disruption, murder, and the choked voice you've terrorized. He wants more blood on his hands so that when he enters his version of paradise, all will be red. Thank you. Wonderful, Patricia. Thank you so much. Everyone, yes, the, the little applause signs for Patricia. Thank you, that was wonderful. All righty. Richard, are you still here? I don't see your name. Let's see. Ah, you're muted. Unmute, unmute. Unmute, unmute. I was I was coughing and so I had to mute myself. I didn't want to interrupt. Very good. How are you doing today? I'm all right. I am really happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. We're glad you're here. All right. As a poet and essayist, Richard Jeffrey Newman's work is rooted in the impact of feminism on his life as a man. As a co-translator of classical Persian poetry, he writes about the impact of that canon on our contemporary lives. His own books of poetry are, most recently, Word for What Those Men Have Done, and For My Son, A Kind of Prayer. Kevin Carey Press published his first book, The Silence of Men, in 2006. His most recent book of translations is The Teller of Tales, story from Ferdowski's um, Shanema, uh, Junction Press, 2011. Newman is on the board of directors of Newton Literary and curates the first Tuesday's reading series in Jackson Heights, New York. He is professor of English and creative writing at Nassau Community College, where he also serves as secretary of and writes the blog for his faculty union, the Nassau Community College Federation of Teachers. Richard? Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you really so much, so much for inviting me. It really is, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I have not, let me just adjust my screen a little bit. I have not, um, I've not given a reading in a while, so this is a real pleasure. Uh, I'm going to read four poems. The first two um, are kind of about missing people, which I thought is appropriate since so many of us have been kind of locked up for so long. And the second two are um, a little bit more politically engaged, let's say. The third, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this now, and so I, I don't kind of interrupt the flow of the poems. The third poem is one that Jonathan actually published in an earlier form. Um, in, um, in Unlikely Stories a couple of years ago. So the first poem is called Because. Because I refuse to learn to say goodbye, these words, but because they are not my skin, and because my fingers are not syllables, and because your voice on the phone is not breath I can take into my mouth and taste. And the phone when we speak is not your body in my arms or your hand lifting my chin so our eyes meet when you say, I love you. And because when I imagine your hand lifting my chin, I want to live within that moment with you the way language lives within us, I am here, wrestling these lines into form. And because the form is me when you read it, I'll be there and we'll touch. My body, fresh from dreaming you. 
The dream took me where it wanted to. The dark outside the friend's house I stayed in those last few days before I flew back home. You drove off. Your daughter would soon wake up for school and you could not be late. Left me standing in the street with a bag over my shoulder as if I had no place else to be. Staring down the avenue, I could no longer see your car on. I let the storm soak me through, thinking that if the world were just, the rain would wash me clean of my desire. It did not. And so here I am, walking the streets of where I live, the dog pulling hard, chasing smells that are to me a fog of nothing. Above us, the clouds move slowly east, silent gods, heavy with what we need to live. If I say you bear what I need to live, it would be true. But you are an ocean and more away, so I'm writing this in my head, pulling each line taut as if it were a leash. Lifting his snout to the breeze, the dog does not know why I've stopped beneath these griffins, keeping watch at the garden gate. He does not know you are not here to rise to, or that I rise nonetheless. So this is, um, this is the poem that Jonathan published some years ago in Unlikely Stories. It's called, Because I Can't Not Know What He Saw. Because I Can't Not Know What He Saw. And there's an, uh, an epigraph, remembering a photograph from Iris Chang's The Rape of Nan King. This month, Harper's readings brings from the people of Boro in Eastern India, a list of verbs impossible in English. Khonse, to pick an object up with care. Dasa, not to place a fishing instrument. Asusu, to feel unknown in a new place. Some sound like Yiddish curses. You should or dig soil like a swine, or may your children gogre fall in a well unknowingly. I want that kind of verb for the way whoever it was pulled the woman's robe up over her head. For how the men, the man who did this to her forced to watch, brother, father, husband, son, neighbor, for how each of them invades my sleep. And for the way I felt when I first saw it, what I feel now remembering it, the way I kept taking Iris Chang's The Rape of Nanking off the shelf and crouching in the corner of Border's lower level to stare and to stare. For that too, I want a verb. And I want a verb as well, and it's not rape though certainly he raped her for the sword hilt rising from between her parted thighs. And for the way I hate myself for hoping she was already dead when he buried his blade in her. And um, the last poem, the last poem I will read, um, it's called, It Must Include the Body. I wrote this when George W. Bush was president and like, so many, I think, poems that people may have written back then, it is again, unfortunately relevant. Um, it is again, unfortunately relevant. I will say that, that um, this, is, this is Pride Month, obviously, and the poem, um, I'll just say that the poem, I, I'll read the poem for Pride Month, but I will also say it takes a while to get to where you'll see that it is a poem for Pride Month, so please be patient with it. It must include the body. Belly like a watermelon stuffed up the front of her white cotton summer dress. The pregnant woman at the corner turns her back to me to face the direction she'll cross the street in. And what she's wearing flares from the waist down in a twirl that settles along the line of her hips till only the hem that falls to just above her ankles is still rippling. A flag waving surrender to this late summer, this late September day. 
My eyes lift to her shoulders, follow the contour the fabric traces down from the loops through which her tanned arms emerge to the curve of her butt cheeks that bounce lightly as she steps back, just avoiding the taxi pulling up fast to the curb where she's standing. She's as tall as me or taller, black hair tied tight in a braid, pointing like a compass to the small of her back. And her dress is not unlike the one you wore the night we wandered the beach till the boardwalk lights were stars blinking at our backs and the campfires scattered across the sand were the signal flames of a distant town. The moon over the ocean cast our shadows behind us. You leaned against me, the blue cloth of what you were wearing bunched in my left hand. With my right, I found you wet, though wet doesn't really do it justice. You half purred a laugh as I stroked and pulled and gently parted the hair you let grow in once the lover who kept you shaved was gone. Lifting your face to mine, you whispered that the breeze was like the water's breath just before it touched its tongue to you. And when I kissed the lips you shaped those words with, you came, calling your pleasure out to the open sea for the wind and tide to carry who knows where. Walking back to our hotel, I thought how you have only ever called it your vagina. Then, later, while you slept, I tried to list the rhyming words I'd need to write a sonnet. But China, Carolina, Trichina, and Angina were the best I could do. The off rhymes, Montana, Banana, Cabana, were no better. But then I heard that New York accent you love to mimic. Designer, Fina, Mina, Recliner. That last one bringing back to me the woman from the conference who worried over two more whiskeys than either, us, either of us should have had, that three kids had made her roomier down there than any man other than the husband she'd been needing to leave for years would want, and so she hadn't left him. I can't believe I'm telling you this, she said, blushing that the man she planned to make the next night, the only other man ever to touch her, might think he should be moving furniture in down there, not his dick. If a man cares that much about size, I told her, he doesn't deserve an adulterous woman. The light turns green, and the mother-to-be who started these lines crosses First Avenue into the rest of her life. The crowd she moves with large enough that the left turn I have to wait for will get me to Shahab's school five minutes later than the 15 he's already missed. But why does George Bush care if two men get married, he asks from the back seat, giving voice yet again to last night's bedtime conversation. I know a man's penis fits a woman's vagina, but that's not love. And people love babies, but babies aren't love. And two women, if they get married, each one can have a baby, but even that's not love. Two men can't, but if they love each other, so what? You don't marry a body, you marry a person. Bush doesn't get this. He's an idiot. Our boy takes my hand for the few steps leading up to the building's entrance, letting go as has become his habit, just shy of the security guard's line of sight. Seriously, he says, when I get home, you need to explain this to me. And he's running fast as he can past the front desk, arms and legs pumping, backpacks swinging, the long hair that some still take for a girl's, bouncing with each stride up around his head. I get back into the driver's seat, turn the key, put the car in reverse. With my foot on the brake, my eyes in the rear view mirror stare back at me what I know is true. If you will not love the body, you cannot love the person. I'm glad our son can't yet imagine that. Thank Wonderful. you so very thank you so very much. Thank, thank you. you.
Thanks so much, Richard. All right, the silent claps. Thanks again, we're really glad to have you here. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna turn the show over to Larissa, who's gonna um, give announcements and then run her open mic. Hello, everybody. Um, let's get another hand, please, to the lovely and talented Patricia Spears Jones, Dean Costas, and Jeffrey and Jeffrey Richard Newman, please. Let's get the, the beautiful reading tonight, guys. That was really beautiful. And you all read so well. You're good poets reading well. That's what, what more can you ask? Thank you. Thank you for a great show today. So now we're moving into our open mic. Um, but before we do, I'd like to tell you about some upcoming shows um, that we are going to have here at Lit Bomb. Next week, June 20th, we have a special Irish edition um, with Aidan Rooney, Mary O'Donoghue, and Daniel Tobin. They are going to be zooming in from Ireland, so don't miss that. That's going to be wonderful. And June 27th, we've got Nicole Cooley, Vincent A. Cellucci. Where's he calling in from, Jonathan? The Netherlands. The Netherlands. Vincent's going to call in from the Netherlands. Christopher Shipman and Maura Way. So that's going to be a, another great show on the 27th. Join us next week for our Irish show. That's going to be fabulous. All right. Now, has Rodney A. Brown come on? No. I don't see them, no. I think they're having tech troubles oh, sorry. again. I'm so yeah. sorry. Um, Patricia Carrigan, would you possibly grace us with a poem? Let me unmute her real quick. I, I think she just left. Yeah, she oh. did. Oh, yeah. I think she bad. just left. She said she had to run. Oh, too bad. Okay. So let's hear from Lydia Cortez. All right, Lydia, if you'll give me a second to find your name and ask to unmute. Okay. Hello, Lydia. Thank you. How thank you, you very much. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling well, thank you. And I want to thank you again for having me in we're this grateful, open. We're grateful to have you and your great art here. Let's hear your poem, please. Thank you so much. This us, this they, aggravated assault and battery to our bodies, souls, and minds over matter. Whose matter are you demeaning? The Madonna, the mother of God, who came first, the chicken or the egg, or the mother, or the son, or the holy trinity, or the roly polies, or the royal police saying, I didn't do no thing wrong, nothing. He looked like he was walking away from me, but I knew that tool in his holster was no tool, no fool better than a hammer. If I had a hammer, I'd use it in the morning. I'd use it to smash the weapon he'd use to screw me over. Or was it the driver in a car? pulling her over, working it to let go of some white out red rages. The playing field might have been evener, but all she had was a license to not kill, though that wallet could have been a gun, not the trusty old one, not like the one entrusted by church and state for him to dutifully dutify, enact his trust in the man, He's the man with the trust of the system to keep things in orders, in order of the pledge to keep things contained. The seething angers them at bay cause with that madness, one never knows what they can do. No can, can, little, like little to lose slow trek. The little ones have the most angry stored because they have been kept hungry and mean. So they've got to protect the inner innocence, hidden or disappeared by those in power through their hard works, hard whiskey, hard hearts, who ain't about to give what they earned soft through the swear and the switch of their crow magnet minds abusing now the newer ones coming in the poorer the darker of complex lingos oh say now aren't you all 
can't you see how this all came to be, this dissing, this differencing, this dislocation, this us, this they. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia. Lydia, quite ladies and gentlemen, give her a hand. Okay, next we have something very special for you. Um, we have Jose, poet Jose Enrique Del Monte, who will be reading in Spanish, and, and then um, we will hear his translation by Susan, by his translator, Susan Dickey. Jose, are you with us? Yes, yes, yes. Hello, Jose. Good to see you again. Okay, good, good, Wonderful. Good to see you, everybody. Grace us with your beautiful poetry. Okay. Uh, this poem, the, the name of this poem is Hasta que nos mate la noche. La ciudad que vemos ya no existe. Jorge Luis Borges. En esta ciudad de láminas delgadas, de tirantes alargados y de sueños cortos, en esta ciudad de silencios redondos, de noticias repetidas y de frondas esporádicas, rugen bestias a diario que descuarticen el tiempo y crece el asma como la falta de agua, mueren peces ambulantes sin oxígeno y sin rastro conocido, caen avispas en los fosos o en las cavidades del andén, muere gente rara, gente sin cabeza, sin pulmones, sin arcanos, gente nueva que envejece en horas, rumian los espárragos en medio de la noche, emigran los libros cerrados. En esta ciudad de adversidades, lujo de viento pálido, huella de gritos ancestrales, tierra húmeda para el olvido, nacen nuevos ademanes y la gente comenta puntos suspensivos. Esta ciudad de hordas y verdugos traza las horas con ceniza de fogón, festeja la tristeza engalanada de pres. Aquí donde el aliento se rebana y el asfalto es firmamento, los escupitajos rodados o los metales de los autos, las cunetas rebosadas, el ruido carcomido, los asesinos de honra, nos envuelven todos en papel de celofán y nos entregan las heces con aderezo y vino para reírnos de las esquinas dobladas, de los callejones sin nombre, de los personajes de Rampa y abrazarlos hasta que nos mate la noche. Gracias. Muchas, muchas gracias. Muy amable. Muy, muy, muy hermoso poema. Gracias. Now we're going to have Susan M. Dickey, translator, read the translation. Uh, Susan M. Dickey, how are you today, Susan? I'm doing well. Thank you, Larissa. Good to see you. Can we hear the translation of this wonderful poem? Uh, the title is Until the Night Kills Us. Uh, and uh, it was translated by uh, uh, Arlene Alvarez and myself, and it begins with an epigraph by uh, Jorge Luis Borges, the city we love, and the city we see no longer exists. In the city of thin sheets, of elongated braces and short dreams, in the city of round silences, of repeated news and of sporadic fronds, Beasts roar daily and pierce the will of others, and asthma grows like the lack of water. Fish die walking without oxygen, with no known trace. Wasps fall into pits or into the cavities of platforms. Strange people die, people without heads, without lungs, without mystery, New people who age in hours uh, ruminate asparagus in the middle of the night. The closed books emigrate in the city of adversity, flow of pale wind, traces of ancestral screams, humid ground for the oblivion. New gestures are born and people comment on ellipses. The city of hordes and executioners traces the hours with fire ash, celebrates sadness adorned with glory. Here, where time is sliced, the asphalt shines as the firmament and the spit mark it forever. The metal of cars, the overflowing ditches, the broken misery, the worm-eaten noise, the killers of honor, 
they are all wrapped up in cellophane. And give us the feces with dressing and wine to make us laugh at the bent corners, at the unnamed alleys, at the underworld characters, and embrace us until the night kills us. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much, Susan. And thank you, um, Jose Enrique Del Monte and Susan Dickey. What a great team. Thank you very much for that. Okay, I'm going to try one more open micer. We don't have Rodney A. Brown, but I'm wondering if Francine Witt would grant, would, would, Francine, would you, would you read us a poem if you can? I'd be happy to. Wonderful. Where's Francine? Jonathan? Okay, now I, I I couldn't do the mute thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, nice to see everybody, by the way. Um, so I'll read a, a poem called Some Nights. Some nights you are an old man who, thinking he once saved a jar of starlight, believes that he can sprinkle it any time. You look at me, our love gone like a daughter we lost to disease, who now sits each, each night at our dinner table and refuses to be fed. We prop her up anyway and coax silver spoons into her mouth. I am an old woman who has saved all her dresses, convinced they will come back in style. My favorite, a heart scarlet mini, I, I once wore before we met. I have a photo of me wearing it. I am a twist in a braid of dancers on some ancient disco floor. Most nights, I know I am not that girl anymore. The girl who didn't know that soon she would stop dancing, marry a dreamless man, and wear the same faded dress forever. Other nights, I nudge foodless air into our invisible daughter, watch you walk away from the table listen to you in the next room, trying to thunk the starlight out of an empty jar. Thank you so much, Francine. Give it up for Francine, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for reading on the spot for us. We appreciate it. I appreciate so it. We've, yes. <laughs> come, we've come to the end of our show. I want to tell you that uh, Lit Bomb believes Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. That should go without saying. Um, and we thank the protesters for fighting for our freedom of thought and the diversity we need as artists in order to live, survive, and create. So thank you to the Black Lives Matter um, movement and Lit Bomb believes Black Lives Matter. We, and and um, we are grateful. We are grateful to the activists who are making this change, this fundamental and needed change in our society. Mark, anybody have any final last words? I think I think we can say that was this was a wonderful night. Thank thank you everybody for for joining us and um, um, yeah. Thank you. Of, thank you thank you to our open micers and thank you Dean Costas, Patricia Spears Jones, and Richard Jeffrey Newman. Another hand for them, please. Thanks so much. And that is a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Please come back next week for our special Irish edition with Aidan Rooney, Mary O'Donoghue, and Daniel Togan. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Mm -hmm.